welcome to a new video series tagged 40 days to jam now in this video series i'll be creating 40 videos that cut across various topics in chemistry from the introductory aspect of chemistry to the last part of chemistry according to the jam syllabus now you can see we are on the first episode of the series and it is atomic structure so the topic we'll be discussing today will be on atomic structure and if you are new here you've not yet subscribed to this channel do well to subscribe and also turn on the post notification bell icon so when a new video is being posted you get notified and also share these videos with your friends now let's talk about the atomic structure now before we get into the video the good thing about this series is that each, each videos that are being posted follow a precise pattern whereby before I start this topic I'm going to give an outline on what we'll be talking about and also after that a guilted class and at the end we'll solve different past question according to jam syllabus so guys let's quickly start now you can see we are talking about the atomic structure on this atomic structure we'll be learning the differences between atoms molecules ions radicals so in this lesson we'll be learning the difference between these steps atoms molecules ions and radicals after that we'll talk about various discoveries that cut across this topic and at the end we'll talk about quantum numbers quantum numbers now let's talk about the difference between atoms molecules ions and radicals okay now the first question you ask yourself what are atoms now atoms are the smallest particle of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction i say atoms is the smallest particle of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction now it is not by defining the term atoms we have to understand what this statement is talking about now you can see atom is the smallest particle of an element so when we are talking about atoms our mind should be focused on elements now let's take let's take an example now you can see this is oxygen now whenever you see this in chemistry because most students or most persons when they just see oxygen they'll just say it is called oxygen molecule meanwhile it is not you can see here it is standing in its atomic state in the sense that we just have one oxygen here so when you see this it is pronounced oxygen atom because sometimes most persons just say it's oxygen molecule meanwhile it is not it is oxygen atom because you are we are seeing just one atom of oxygen that is why atoms has to do with elements oxygen here is just an element standing alone now let's take an, another example using this element and this is called chlorine now pronouncing this according to this term it is called chlorine atom not chlorine molecule so it means that talking about atom or talking about atom our mind should be focused on elements just that element so i recap atoms are the smallest particle of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction 
Now let's find the difference between atoms and molecules. Now let's talk about molecules. Molecules are the smallest particle of a substance, of a substance, here, element, that can exist alone or independently and still retain that same chemical identity of that atom. That is a molecule. Now, it must be noted that for a molecule to be formed, we need at least two atoms of that element. Now, this is what I mean. Now, I said for a molecule to be formed, we need two atoms at least of that element. Now, this is element. Now, this element is oxygen. So, when we have one oxygen atom bonding to another oxygen atom, now, you can see when you are asked how many oxygen atoms are present here. Two oxygen atoms. So, we bring them together to write O2. So, whenever you see this in chemistry, it is pronounced as oxygen molecule. So, it means that for we to get a molecule, we need at least two atoms of that element. Now, let's take example using chlorine. Now, this is chlorine atom, bonding to another chlorine atom. Bringing them together, we get Cl2. So, it is pronounced chlorine molecule. So, you can see here that when we talk about molecule, we need at least two atoms of that element. Now, I said at least. So, it means that we can have three atoms forming a molecule, four atoms forming a molecule. Eight atoms forming a molecule. Now, let's take another example. Now, let's use phosphorus as a case study. Phosphorus. Now, phosphorus as an element is given with the symbol P. So, it means that whenever we just see this, we will say it is phosphorus atom because it's standing alone. But now, it must be noted that phosphorus as an element is tetra atomic what does it mean it means that for we to get the molecule form of phosphorus we need four atoms tetra atomic because tetra means four so phosphorus atom bonding to another phosphorus atom bonding to another phosphorus atom and bonding to another phosphorus atom so when we bring this together we'll get p4 this is pronounced Phosphorus molecule. Phosphorus molecule. And this phosphorus molecule has another name. It is also called white phosphorus. White phosphorus. And it must be noted that white phosphorus is toxic. White phosphorus is toxic. So you can see here for we to get a molecule, we used four atoms of phosphorus. Now, we have other case studies, same in ozone. Now, this is ozone. And for we to get ozone, we need three atoms of oxygen. So, it means that ozone comprises of three atoms of oxygen, which is O3. So, it is called oxygen molecule, as this is called oxygen molecule, but it is also called ozone, as this is also called dioxygen because we have two oxygen atoms. So I believe now we now know the difference between atoms and molecules. Now let's quickly talk about ions and radicals. What are ions? What are radicals? Now it must be noted that ions are charged, charged atoms. So what does it mean? It means that for we to get an ion, we need a charged atom. I did not say a charged molecule. Now, ions are charged atom. Now, we have two types of ions, basically. We have cats ions and we have anions. Now, cat ions, cat ions are positively charged. And ions are negatively charged. I said for we to get an ion, we need 
a charged atom. We need an atom, basically not a molecule. So look at this. This is chlorine. This is chlorine atom. This is sodium. This is sodium atom. Now this, that is chlorine. Chlorine is an halogen and all halogens have negative charge. Negative one charge. So it means that since this chlorine is negatively charged, it is an ion. And now, it, I said ions are charged atom, not charged molecule. So if we had something like Cl2 minus, it would not be correct. Because for we to get an ion, we need, a, we need an atom. Atom, because this is the atomic state of oxygen, chlorine only. This is the molecular state of chlorine. This is wrong. So it must be noted, this is called chlorine atom and also it bears a charge. So it accounts to be called an ion. This can never be called an ion because it is in its molecular state. For ions, ions are in their charged atom state. So this is negatively charged. Sodium is a metal. Metals are positively charged. So this that is a negative charge will be called an anion because anions are negatively charged. Now, this that is positively charged will be called a cation because cations are positively charged atoms. Now, that is that for ions. Now, let's quickly move over to radicals. What are radicals? Now, radicals are groups of atoms which behaves as a single charge unit so it means that for we to get a radical we need various groups of atoms now this is an example of a radical and it must be noted in the radical they bear a single charge so all of those atoms combined together bear a single charge now this is an example of a radical N O O O minus. So, what element is this? Nitrogen. What element is this? Oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. Now, you know, writing it like this, because this is actually a radical, but writing it like this will be ambiguous because we have to make it very, very easy and simple. Now, this is nitrogen. Write it. We have to condense it together. So, how many oxygen atoms are present in this radical? Three oxygen atoms. So, O, three being a charge minus one so this radical has a name and it is called the nitrate radical it is called the nitrate radical now let's take another example c o o o two minus now we have to condense it so this is carbon how many oxygen atoms we have Three oxygen atoms, so you write C, O, 3, 1, 2, 3, bearing the single charge, 2 minus. This radical has a name and it is called the carbonate radical. It is called the carbonate radical. It is called the carbonate radical. Now let's take another example that is more advanced, but it's very easy. Now look at this. C, R, bonding to C, R again, O, 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 Now, it must be noted that this element here is called chromium. And these are oxygen atoms. How many oxygen atoms are present here? Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, how many chromium atoms are present here? Two. So, it means that we want to condense it. Right? CRO2. O7 the charge to minus this radical has a name it is called a chromate radical it is called a chromate radical so i believe now you understand the difference between atoms molecules ions and radicals now let's quickly move over to the second outline which is discoveries on atomic structures now let's quickly move over to discoveries on atomic structure 
various sciences and what they discover because this part of chemistry is very very important in jam exam so if you are preparing for jam exam and you're watching this video do well to take note of these sciences i'll be writing their names and what they discovered now let's quickly talk about something this is an atom and these are the shells of this atom now this atom bears a, 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 a positively charged nucleus this is the nucleus of an atom this is the nucleus of an atom now this nucleus comprises of two subatomic particles and what are the subatomic particles the first is proton and the second is neutron protons are positively charged neutrons are neutral now on these shells we have various electrons okay on these shells we have various electrons so these are the electrons and it must be noted that electrons are negatively charged so this is what i mean so for the first let's talk about who discovered the nucleus of an atom the nucleus of an atom the nucleus of an atom was discovered by a scientist called lord ernest rutherford lord ernest rutherford that is for the nucleus of an atom. Now let's talk about the other subatomic particles. Uh, let's just say proton now. Proton. Now, protons, since they are found in the nucleus, actually, this same man called Lord Ernest Rutherford discovered protons. Okay? Lord Ernest Rutherford discovered protons. Now, let's talk about another. And let's say it is electron. This is another subatomic particle found in the nucleus of an atom. Now, who discovered electron? Electrons were discovered by a man called J. J. Thomson. Okay, J. J. Thomson discovered electrons. Now, let's talk about the next, which is neutrons. Now, who discovered neutron? Neutrons was discovered by a man called James Chadwick. Okay, now let's talk about others like the likes of discovery of um charge of an electron using the oil drop oil drop experiment charge of an electron using the oil drop experiment was done by a man called Robert Arrow Andrew Millikan. Robert Andrew Millikan discovered the charge of an electron using the oil drop experiment number six. Now let's talk about the discovery of the specific charge. Specific charge is different from just charge of an electron also called the charge to mass ratio so the specific charge of an electron is also called the charge to mass ratio this was discovered by a man called j j thompson now charge to mass ratio charge to mass ratio can be given with a symbol which is E stroke M because E here signifies the charge and mass here signifies the M. So this is charge to mass ratio, also called the specific charge of an electron. And this was discovered by J.J. Thomson. Now let's talk about the seventh person. And the particle I'll be talking about is called anode ray. Now, Arnold Ray was discovered by a scientist called Eugene Goldstein. Eugene Goldstein. Eugene Goldstein discovered Arnold Ray. Now, this I'll be talking about the cathode ray. Okay? The cathode ray. The cathode ray was discovered by a man called Williams. 
William Scrooge. Okay, now the ninth person I'll be talking about was uh, the, what he discovered was X ray. Now, X ray was discovered by a man called Wilhelm. I did not say Williams, I said Wilhelm Rotenji. So, the tenth person or the tenth discovery I'll be talking about is isotopy. Now, it must be noted here that isotopy was first discovered in the year 1912, and a year later, a man called another man discovered the same isotopy in the year 1913. Now, the first person that actually discovered isotopy was a man called Frederick Soli. Frederick Soli. But the other person that actually discovered it a year later was called Francis. Wilhelm Aston. Okay, so you can see here for isotopy, we have two scientists. The first person, Frederick Sodi, the second person, Francis William Aston. When you see exam based question on this particular discovery, and you see both options in the question, what you are to do right now is this you are to choose the first person, which is Frederick Sodi. So, the discovery of isotope was first credited to him, but a year later, this man discovered it. So, when you don't see this, that's when you can choose this. But when you see both, you choose the first. When you don't see this in the option, this will be the right answer. But when you see both, you choose this as the correct answer. So, that is that for isotope. 11. Atomic number. Now, atomic number was discovered by a man called Henry Moseley. Okay, Henry Moseley. Okay, now, 12. Symbols to classify elements. Now, this was done by a man called John Jacob Berzelius. Okay. John Jacob Bezelius. So that's, um, these are basically discoveries, okay? And they are discoverers. So we are to take note of this because it is very, very important and inevitable for jam exam. So that is that for discoveries. Now let's quickly move over to the last section of this video, which is tagged quantum numbers. So this part of chemistry is a very, very technical part and it's very, very easy. So at the end of this video, I believe you, you'll be able to solve problems pertaining to quantum numbers. So let's quickly see that. Now, on atomic structure, there are four quantum numbers that must be noted. So the first of them is called the principal, the principal quantum number. Now, the principal quantum number is denoted with a symbol and it is N, not capital letter N but small letter N. Now, the next of the quantum number I'll be discussing is called azimuthal quantum number. Azimuthal quantum number. Azimuthal quantum number is also called subsidiary quantum number subsidiary quantum number if you don't want to call it subsidiary quantum number you can call it secondary quantum number okay secondary quantum number or if you don't want to call it either of these names lastly you can call it angular momentum quantum number angular momentum quantum number so you can see for the second quantum number, the first, the, the first name is called azimuthal. If you don't call it that, you can call it subsidiary quantum number or secondary quantum number or angular momentum quantum number. Now, this quantum number is denoted with the symbol and it is small l, okay, not capital letter l, small l. Now, the next of the quantum number I'll be discussing is called magnetic quantum number. 
magnetic quantum number. Magnetic quantum number is denoted with a symbol and it is ML. So it means that the second quantum number is relating to magnetic quantum number because if you check the symbol, there is azimuthal quantum number in magnetic quantum number according to the symbol. So they have relationship which we will see as we proceed in this video. So the last of the quantum number is called spin quantum number. It's called spin quantum number. And spin quantum number is denoted with the symbol and it is S. Spin quantum number is denoted with the symbol and it is S. So let's quickly describe the first quantum number, which is the principal quantum number. Because I said the principal quantum number is denoted with a symbol and that symbol is N, small letter N. So class, let's quickly uh, talk about the principal quantum number. It must be noted that the principal quantum number describes, describes the main, main energy level of an atom. This point is very, very important. The principal quantum number describes the main energy level of an atom and also it tells us or describes the size. The size. I did not say shape. I said size of an orbital. Okay? So the question you ask yourself, what are orbitals? Orbitals, this is the region in space where there is a high possibility of finding an electron. But the region in space where there is a low possibility of finding an electron is called nodal plane. Okay? The region in space where there is a low possibility of finding an electron is called nodal plane. But a region in space where electrons can never be seen is called forbidden state. So it must be noted here that the principal quantum number describes the size of an orbital. And I said earlier that the orbital is the region in space where there's a high possibility of finding electrons. Now, let's talk about the last point on the principal quantum number. Now, the principal quantum number describes the shell in an atom. Shell in an atom. So, the question you ask yourself, what are these shells? What are these shells? The first shell we have is called the K shell, the L shell, the N shell, and the N shell. These are the shells. The K shell, the L shell, the N shell, and the N shell. Now, these shells have numbers allocated to them. Now, for the K shell, the number is 1. For the L shell, the number is 2. For the M shell, the number is 3. For the N shell, the number is 4. So what does it mean? It means that this principal quantum number, which is denoted with N, actually tells us the numbers of the shells. Okay? Then, so if you are asked, what is the value for N for the K shell 1? What is the value for N for the L shell 2? What is the value for M, sorry, N for the N shell 3? What is the value for N for the K for the N share rather four? So it means that the principal quantum number which is denoted with N actually tells us the number of these shells: the K shell, the L shell, the N shell, and the N shell. So take note of this. This is very important. So we'll come back to this. Let's quickly move over to the next quantum number, which is called the azimuthal quantum number. So let's talk about the azimuthal quantum number. You should be with your jotting materials because these points are very, very important for your exam. So let's talk about the next, which is called the azimuthal quantum number. Recall I said azimuthal quantum number is also called subsidiary quantum number, also called angular momentum quantum number, or you call it the secondary quantum number. And this angle, uh, azimuthal quantum number is denoted with a symbol, and that symbol is L. Recall I said earlier that I said earlier 
that the end actually tells us which is the principal quantum number tells us the value for the shell and these are the shell the k shell the l shell m shell and n shell so for this is one for this is two for this is three and for this is four we'll come back to this this is very important for solving practice problems so let's proceed i say the azimuthal quantum number is denoted with the l so what does the azimuthal quantum number describe it describes it describes the sub energy level of an atom so if you check for the principal quantum number as seen previously i said that it describes the main energy level of an atom not the sub so for sub is credited to the azimuthal quantum number next point on the azimuthal quantum number it describes it describes the shape of an orbital it describes the shape of an orbital i did not say it describes the size the orbital sorry the quantum number that describes size of an orbital is the principal quantum number but the quantum number that describes the shape of an orbital is the azimuthal quantum number so we've discussed that this orbital is the region in space where there's a high possibility of finding an electron so it must be noted here that for orbitals what are these orbitals that will be the question what are these orbitals let's talk about it what are these orbitals now this orbital the first orbital we have is called the s orbital the p orbital the d orbital the f orbital so we have the s p d f orbitals now these orbitals have numbers allocated to them now for s orbital it's for the azimuthal quantum number the, the numbers ranges start from zero to infinity so it means that for s orbital it is zero for p orbital it is one for d orbital it is two f orbital three so what actually give, give us this value it is l so if you are asked what is the value for l for the s orbital zero what is the value for l for the p orbital one what is the value for L for the D orbital 2. What is the value for L for the F orbital 3? So it means that it must be noted that for the azimuthal quantum number, its value ranges from 0 down to infinity. But for the principal quantum number, its value ranges from 1 down to infinity. So this is very, very important. Now, let's quickly proceed. Let's talk about the relationship between the principal quantum number and the azimuthal quantum number because this is very important for jam exam after this i'll be solving practice problems that cut across this topic so stay with me as we proceed so we've learned here that we have various orbitals and these orbitals have numbers so these are the orbitals s orbital we have the p orbital we have the d orbital and the f orbital so talking about the s orbital zero p one two and three so let's talk about the relationship between both orbitals the relation sorry the relationship between both quantum number relationship between n and l the relationship between principal quantum number and azimuthal quantum number now they are related with a formula or a mathematical expression this is principal quantum number this is azimuthal quantum number. The formula is simply this. To calculate for your azimuthal quantum number, it is actually n minus 1. So what does it mean? It means that the azimuthal quantum number is lagging the principal quantum number by 1. Look at what I mean. For example, let's solve a question. Let's solve a question. For example, they said given the principal quantum number to be four what is the value i said what is the value i did not say what are the values what is the value for l for l so it is very very easy if you are asked this very easy from this mathematical expression to calculate for this question n become n minus one what is your n given four minus one so what will be the azimuthal quantum number now 
3. So when n is equal to 4, what is the value for l, which is azimuthal quantum number 3? So it means that this azimuthal quantum number is lagging the principal quantum number by 1. You can get it from here. Now, they said giving n to be 4. This is our n. This is n to be 4. What is the value for the uh, azimuthal quantum number? This is your azimuthal quantum number. What's the value? That is under it. It is 3. So you can see here, you can use this or you can use the formula method. I believe this will be very easy for you. So it must be noted when they ask what is the value for L, you just provide one value and that value is 3. So when we are asked, when we ask when N is 3, what will be L? Very easy. We call L is equal to N minus 1. So L becomes 3 minus 1. So L becomes 2. So when we are asked, when we are asked this question using the phrase, what are the values, not what is the value? What are the values? That means what are the values for L? L when N is 4. Very easy. L will not be equal to. We already know that for we to get for we to get L, we need to know N from the formula. So it's simple. The values, the values for L will range from. You already know that L ranges from zero. So it's going to range from zero, one, two, and three. So if you are going to ask how many values did you get for N when N is four, you got four values. One, two, three, four. You can see here is three. So we are we are trying to write to three. So we start from zero because L told us we should start from zero. So what are the values for L when N is equal to three? Very easy. We just take start from our zero, one, two. Because now what are the value for L when N is three? One, two, three. Three values. Okay, that is how it's gotten. So you can see here that the relationship between N and L is very easy by calculating it. Okay, now let's say we are asked to calculate it the other way around. And we were given L, which is as a quantum number, to be 2. They said look for N. Very easy. Make N subject. We already know L is equal to N minus 1. So making N subject, it becomes, it comes here, L plus 1. When plus, sorry, minus crosses the quality sign, changes to plus. So N becomes... N becomes 2 plus 1. So N becomes 3. Okay, you can see how it solves. So please take note of this formula. It is very, very important. So guys, let's quickly proceed to the next quantum number and it is called magnetic quantum number. Magnetic quantum number. Now let's quickly talk about the third quantum number and it is called magnetic quantum number. Magnetic quantum number is denoted with a symbol and it is ML. Okay, now it must be noted that magnetic quantum number, which is ML, ranges, ranges, ranges from plus L to minus L. So what does it mean? It means that for which, let's say we have an L value to be 2. They will not say provide the values for ml very easy it ranges from plus l to minus l so it means that we have to write the for l is equals two so first of all write plus two because that's our plus l now we cannot just write plus plus two to minus two because from plus two to minus two there are other values so ml will not be equal to plus two after plus 2, we are trying to hit a 0, but we go to the negative side. So it means that plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2. So you can see here, when L is 2, provide the value for ML. You just need to bring from plus L to minus L. So these are the values for ML when L equals to 2. So let's try this other one. Let's try this other one. When L is equal to one what is the value for ml very easy plus l to minus l so plus one to minus one so in between here they have we have value so plus one zero minus one so these are the values for ml when l is equals to one 
So you try this in the comment section. I provide it in the comment section. When L is equal to 3. Provide a value for L here. Okay? Let's quickly talk about what the magnetic quantum number actually describes. What the magnetic quantum number actually describes. First, it describes the number of orbiters in a given sub shell. It describes number of orbitals in a given sub shell. Now, this phrase or statement I just made is called, this is called degree of degeneracy. So it means that number of orbitals in a given subshell is called degree of degeneracy. And what quantum number describes that? Magnetic quantum number. Now, degree of degeneracy is given with the symbol D and it has a formula. It is 2L plus 1. So the question you ask yourself, what is L? Recall, L is called azimuthal quantum number. It does not change. L is called azimuthal quantum number. Now, let's quickly solve a question under this aspect. Now, let's quickly move over to this question. The question says, which of the following orbitals is five-fold degenerate? What does it mean? Degenerate means how many times can this orbital actually form different boxes? Or how many times can this orbital break? I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. So it means here that, it means here that we have various orbitals. These are the orbitals. The S orbital, the P orbital, the D orbital, and the F orbital. So, so it means that, you know, now let's check for the S orbital, which is the first option. And what is the value for L for the S orbital? Zero. So, how to calculate degree of degeneracy? Very easy. D is equal to 2L plus 1. So, the L value here is already 0. So, D will not be equal to 2 into 0 plus 1. So, D will not be equal to 2. Sorry. 2 times 0 is 0. So, D will not be equal to 1. That is why for the S orbital, we always draw one box. For the S orbital, that is why we always draw one box. You can see here the value it is one for the S orbital. The degree of genesis is one. So they call S orbital non-degenerate. It did not degenerate. It did not break down or did not form any other box except the first box. So that is why S orbital has one box. Now, and this is not the answer because it is not five-fold degenerate. Let's check for the P orbital. For P orbital. Now, for P orbital, what's value for L? 1. So, D formula is equal to 2L plus 1. So, D will not be equal to 2 into 1 plus 1. D will not be equal to 2 plus 1. D will not be equal to 3. So, that is why for the, uh, for the P orbital, we always draw three boxes. So, this is the first, another, and three boxes. Okay? Three boxes. So, that is that for the P Orbit. And that is not the answer because they're asking us for five-fold degenerate. So let's check for the D orbital. We already know that the value for L for D orbital is 2. So D formula is equal to 2L plus 1. So D will not be equal to degree of genesis is equal to 2 into 2 plus 1. So D will not be equal to 4 plus 1. D will not be equal to 5. So the answer now becomes option C because it, it broke down five times. That is why for the D orbital, we always draw five boxes. One, two, three, four, five. So let's check for the uh, F orbital. But you can do this and tell me the answer. How many boxes are we going to draw for the F orbital? It's very easy. When you follow this pattern, you get the answer. So the value for L for the F orbital is three. So you solve with it and provide the number of boxes that the F orbital carries. So you can see now how this thing actually works. It is very, very easy. I believe now you understood the concept on the atomic structure. Okay? Now, if you have any questions, you can provide it in the comment section below. I'm going to answer your question. And also, subscribe to this channel and also share my videos with your friends.
it's going to help you a lot. 40 days to jam. So this is episode one. Watch out for the next episode. Thanks very much. God bless you all.